Hello, and welcome to another Focus Friday, brought to you by Mapex and Majestic. My name is John Harville, and we're having just an awesome time doing these. Every week we get to talk to another wonderful educator uh, doing great things in the percussion community. And uh, it's been a real honor to do these, and to, we're just having a ton of fun doing it. Uh, we hope that you're checking out our Stay at Home, Learn at Home, Play at Home initiative. A lot of great things coming out uh, of that. If you've ever thought that it's time to bring home your own marching drum, snare, tenors, now is a really good time to check into that. We're doing some amazing things with those prices to make those drums not just something you do at high school or college or drum corps, but in the comfort of your own home. Uh, today, I'm really happy to meet uh, this next gentleman and uh, to talk to him. He's got a wealth of knowledge of 25 years at uh, Lassiter High School and uh, 35, almost 40 years of teaching all together. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun with Mr. Mike Lynch. Thank you for stopping in. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, man, this is great. It's, it's really great to meet you. And I, you know, it's, you know, just coming in, I'm just getting to know some of these great talents. And, you know, it's, uh, yeah, each week is just a, another great educator. And uh, we've really learned a lot. I hope that all of our viewers are enjoying all this. And, you know, it's certainly, certainly the case today. Yeah, I, I hope so. Also, hopefully I'll say something that uh be motivational for someone. Yeah, I'm sure it will. Hey, what do you, uh, what have you been doing in this, uh, this time of isolation, you know? Uh, seems like I'm doing what a lot of other people are doing. All these home projects that you that you never that you never had time to do them during the school year. Um, actually, getting around to those right now. And so um, we we had a remodeling project we had started before the pandemic. And so we're I'm trying to help out with that and finish that up. And yeah. uh, um, a couple of years ago, I started collecting old vintage drums, mainly snare drums. And so. Uh, I'm kind of, I work on those quite often, try to clean those up and fix them up and give them new life. That's cool. Something that is another project, but relevant to, still relevant. You still, still can't get away. Well, I do, I do ride on a couple of bikes that I ride quite often. So um, hopefully I'll be getting back into that uh, a little bit later on. Got it. Very cool. Well, so uh, for the for those of us who uh, viewers that don't know, you have been doing this for quite a while, uh, and you've done so uh, so many things, so successful at it, such a long time. Um, growing up in the southeast, um, so you primarily at which high school were you at? I was at Lasseter High School for the past twenty four years, uh, but I taught at two other schools previous to that. Got it. So, like I said, growing up in the, the Southeast, um, we know when Lasseter is coming, if we go to some of those things. And it, it is the one to, to go back in and to, you know, make sure you catch because it's just so consistent. Um, so how, how has that been doing that for, you know, almost a quarter of a century there at that place? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's been a great ride. I mean, I couldn't ask to be in a better spot and actually, my my real job has actually been middle school band director, and that's what a lot of people a lot of people just think I teach percussion. That's all I do, and that's not the case at all. Um, I just retired four years ago from being a middle school band director, so I spent 32 years doing that. Wow. And so then, uh, 32 years doing that, and then the past four years, I've just I've just been teaching percussion at Lasseter, uh, which is a total of 36 years I've been been doing this. 30, 36 years, 36 years of kids at various levels of percussion. <laughs> just, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a saint is what you are, <laughs> you know, to, to go through that for 36 years. Uh, what, what has kept you motivated to do this for such a long time? Uh, you know, Alfred Watkins, the legendary band director at Laster, was really great about um, planning, planning things ahead of time. You knew what was coming up three or four years in advance, you know what was coming up. And he was great about switching gears and changing things around. He didn't want to do the same things uh, 
every year, same events every year, because uh, he felt like it was going to burn the kids out doing the same thing over and over. And, um, you know, we had really good at retention rate. I think it's because we, we switched gears so much. And it also was great for the staff. We didn't get bored doing the same thing year after year after year. And so we knew, you know, one year would be a big marching band year. Maybe the next year we would uh, go do a Rose's Parade or a Macy's Parade. Then, um, you know, maybe the following year would be a, a travel year for the percussion ensemble. We would go somewhere and perform. So I, I think that has helped a lot, just um, being able to do a lot of different things. It wasn't a school where we did the same, same thing year after year. Right. So I would say a lot of being just prepared and not having the stress of so many last minute things that that probably helps that longevity be a little easier to take of, you know, not being so, oh my gosh, last second things. Yeah, we, we always try to do, do a good job of planning ahead. Uh, because, I mean, those trips and those things, they cost, they cost money. And so the booster club always had to have time to prepare what was going on. And uh, the staff also, yeah, we always kind of knew what was happening, what was, what was coming up next so we could prepare. And I always thought about it. I was in one year, um, and I knew the following year the was, uh, percussion ensemble was going to go somewhere. I would try to spend time in the spring maybe – busting everybody's chops and a little bit more on keyboard than, than snare drum. Or if I knew it was going to be a, a big marching year, maybe I'd work their snare drum chops a little bit more. So I knew what was coming up the next year. So I always tried to kind of prepare for that the year, year ahead of time. Wow. So that makes a whole lot of sense of probably to y'all's success as just knowing that what you really are prepping the kids for a year, two years in advance. Yeah. Yeah, it was, he, was, he was a genius. That, man, wow, that's, that's really cool. That's not, you know, for the upper echelon, it's probably common, but we were always kind of holding on by the seat of our pants and, you know, just trying to fly by. Um, so at Lasseter, you guys are two-time BOA champs, 12-time regionals, uh, lots of different parades. How many times? The Macy State Parade? I, I can see it behind you. Yeah. Yeah, we did, uh, we did Macy's three times, um, and we actually did the Rose Parade four times. Uh, well, the band actually did it five times, I believe. Uh, I was there for four of those. That's cool. Three, four, five, three times. How many times are you going to go out to California for that? That's cool. That Macy's Day, that's a big thing for the kids. Yeah, I mean, both parades, I mean – what was incredible also, there was one school year, uh, 2004 to 2005, I believe, we actually did both of those parades in the same school year. <laughs> That's traveling from Georgia, traveling to New York, and then going from Georgia to California. Uh, yeah, Alfred had applied for both parades one year, thinking that we would get into one, and he didn't, didn't know that we got accepted or didn't realize we were going to get accepted to both parades. So he didn't want to, um, you know, not go to one, uh, in, afraid that he wouldn't ever be accepted again, or the band would never be accepted again. So he talked to the booster club and the, uh, the parents and the band boosters decided they wanted to do both parades. And so that was a, a, a lot of fundraising on their part. And so we were able to, to do both parades in one school year. There was, there was 37 days between the two parades. And so I, I, re, I remember the t-shirt that year was last of band coast to coast in 37 days. <laughs> that's very, <laughs> that's very cool because, uh, it, and what is the size of the last of band? Just so everybody kind of knows. Well, we stayed around 250 for a while. I mean, at the largest, we were pushing 400. Um, there was a, a few years there. We actually had two marching bands. Uh, we had the, the competitive band, and then we had the JV band of about 80 or 90 students. And so the kids actually had to audition for the, the top marching band at one point in time. But the other schools opened, and uh, theater programs changed. And so uh, that took some of the took some of the numbers off there. So we held it around two feet for a while and, uh, and um, you know, gotten a little smaller since then. Okay. Still, that's a lot of kids running around New York and California. 
Yes, it is. It was, we had to have a lot of chaperones. <laughs> a lot of chaperones, yeah, very much so. And uh, now, do you have any children that were did the marching thing? Was it a did they have to go that route? Yeah, I, I had um, one one daughter uh, that that went through the program, and when she started band, uh, you know, I tried her out on everything, uh, trying to get her to play trumpet, clarinet, or something. <clears throat> but for some reason, she chose percussion, and so uh, and so yeah, she went through middle school, and then uh, I didn't teach her in middle school, but when she got to Lasseter, so I was a uh, I was a, a band dad along with uh, her percussion instructor or teacher. <laughs> My mom was a substitute, and sometimes she, when she would sub your class, that's a that's a weird spot to be in for the kid. Yeah, there was some uh, there was some long ride homes uh, some of those days after a rehearsal. <laughs> Long, silent rides. Um, now, during your time there, you guys started uh, something called the La uh, Lassiter Percussion Ensemble Symposium. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what that is and what that did for uh, percussion ensembles? Yeah. Um, my entire career, I've always had a percussion ensemble during the winter months. Again, it was part of that switching gears. I thought it was, it was good to just... Um, Get away from the marching stuff a little bit. I thought it was good to, to help uh, make the kids well-rounded. So I've always done percussion ensemble. But the only place we really had to play was to play at our school, play for our parents. And, um, and that was kind of the case with everyone. Uh, I talked to a lot of different directors, instructors, and so there was actually a lot of percussion ensembles around. Nobody knew that each other was doing it because we had no place to perform. You know, if you were lucky, you got to go to your state music convention or Midwest or PASIC or something like that. Now, I'm talking our area here, Southeast. Um, but it was really no place to perform. So I've always wanted to host some, a type of percussion festival. And, uh, but the big, the big problems were facility was number one and then just the amount of equipment that you would need to run it. And so in... Um, I uh, forgot what year it was, the Cobb County School System built the Laster Concert Hall on the campus of Laster High School. And it was uh, it's a gorgeous concert hall. It holds uh, around a, a thousand seats. The stage is huge and the backstage is even bigger. So just tons of room. Uh, it's for music. Uh, there's no drama or anything like that. It's for band, chorus, and orchestra. So acoustically, uh, it sounds wonderful. I thought, okay. There's the facility. Now we need the equipment. And so uh, we have quite a bit of equipment at Lasseter, but not enough to do what I wanted. Because what I wanted was I wanted a set of equipment for the stage. I wanted a set of equipment for the clinic room. And I didn't want the ensemble directors that came, I didn't want them to have to worry about bringing equipment. And so I wanted to furnish everything. So that way the people that come to the Festival, all they have to bring is their small instruments, sticks, and mallets, and that's it. We'll take care of everything else. Um, because, you know, if you come to an event like that, you got to load the truck up when you leave the school, you got to unload when you get to the venue, you got to load back up after you perform, and then you got to get back to school and unload the truck. And so I just, um, I didn't want the, the directors and the kids to have to think about that. I wanted them to be able to stay all day at the festival, listen to other groups, watch other groups, be able to interact with the clinicians and try to make it as educational as possible. So we got um, a set of equipment for the, for the stage. And then um, we also, oh, sorry. Uh, we also um, got a, a set of equipment for the clinic room also. Some of those festivals or some places you go to and the uh, the clinic is the kids are sitting there as the clinician is talking to them and they don't really get to play. Well, I wondered it where the, the kids got to play again. If a, a clinician wanted to talk to them about a certain phrase and a certain selection of music, they could pull that up, have the kids perform and talk about that music, that, that, that selection, that, that phrase. So um, anyway, I, I talked to Chris Hankus about my idea. And he was, um, of course, he works for Mapex Majestic. And uh, he was all excited about it and uh, totally agreed to help out and help su support the event. And so those guys have done an incredible job of helping us out. I mean, we have a lot of equipment at Lasseter, but not enough to do that. 
Um, so they helped out by b bringing down equipment. I think Chris, uh, Jeff Mubblehill, and Rick DeYoung, all three of those guys have taken turns driving equipment trucks from Nashville to Marietta to help us uh, put on the, uh, the symposium. And so uh, my first year, we had 14 groups sign up. And so I didn't know if it was going to work or not. So we had 14 ensembles sign up. And then this year would have been the seventh year. And we had 30 groups signed up this year. Right. Uh, start midday Friday and run Friday and all day Saturday. Um, and I added to that was the, um, we were, after the first year, I think it was me and Chris and Brian Mason, we're having dinner after that Saturday uh, of the festival. And we were talking about ways to make it bigger and better, which we, we try to do every year, try to change something up. And I um, had the idea, I don't know if it was Brian or Chris that came up with the idea that you need a college percussion ensemble to play on Saturday night at the end of the event. So, you know, I thought that was great. And uh, I thought it would be difficult to get groups to come in, but uh, Brian agreed to bring Moorhead State first next year. So he, he brought them. And so since then, we've had University of South Carolina, Florida State, uh, University of Texas, Northwestern University. All those groups have, have come in and performed at Saturday Night Concert. Matter of fact, Northwestern was supposed to be coming back this year to perform at it. Those are, those are incredible ensembles that are, you know, th put the star on top of the tree at the end of the weekend. Yeah, it's been, the support's been incredible. I mean, the, uh, the clinicians, I try to get, uh, you know, world-class clinicians to come in. Uh, we, we've had, I, I don't know, like I said, Brian Mason, Casey Kingelosi, Chi Yi Wu, uh, Tom Burrett, uh, John Parks, uh, Scott Herring, and the list goes on and on of people that have come in and uh, been been clinicians for the ensembles. Wow, wow, that's that's cool. Uh, so that's just a giant um, theater full of concert percussionists and peers, and you know that are just really invested, and and that must be a cool way for them to to play in front of somebody that knows what they're doing and what they're going through and maybe even with a more critical ear than grandma that just thinks they're great no matter what. They get, they get to perform in that hall, uh, which like I said, it's gorgeous. So we take a photo of the, the ensemble on the stage. Uh, we record the ensemble so they have minutes. And then to get, again, get to interact with those, um, you know, world renowned clinicians to get to hear other groups perform and then get to hear a great college group at the end of the night. Uh, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a great event. I was really, really proud of the way that has turned out. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a shame that this thing hit and, you know, we're, we're missing it in 30, 30 ensemble. So in the course of, you know, a really short time, you, you had doubled your participation. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, some years I've had a waiting list. They were, uh, matter of fact, this year we went to total online registration because it was getting so competitive to get in. Uh, it was kind of cutthroat because people were coming to my house and leaving uh, applications in my, my home mailbox and that kind of thing, trying to, try to get in and trying to get in early, trying to get a good slot. So this year we opened up. The registration started at 8 a.m. I believe on a Tuesday. And by noon we were full. That's incredible. That's man, what a there's a need and you met it and we just have to be bigger in the future to keep it going. Um uh, that's very cool, man. You must have this must have been you've must have taught hundreds, if not thousands, of of uh young percussionists over the years. Um uh, anybody stand out? Well, I mean when you start thinking about it, it's actually pretty incredible between the middle school and the high school and all the years I've put in and, you know, the, the, the kids that have participated in the symposium I also teach um, Scott Brown and myself have two summer camps that we run. And one of those camps has been going for 14 years. And between that and we actually, Scott and I both work at the music for all summer symposium, 
we're in charge of the middle school percussion for that event. Uh, and so uh, between all these kids, um, yeah, I've, it's, it's been great, you know, and I love it when a kid comes back and remembers being at the camp and telling me what they're doing now and that sort of thing. And that's, uh, you know, that, that kind of makes it all worthwhile. Right. Yeah, definitely. When they come back and they realize, you know, what you're trying to do for them at that age, that's cool. So you bring up Scott Brown and uh, Scott's a great guy and you guys are doing the, tell us a little bit about the, the Atlanta percussion uh, camp and the North Georgia percussion camp and what's the goal that you guys set out to achieve there every summer? Yeah, the North Georgia percussion camp, uh, like I said, it started 14 years ago. And it was me and Scott and another friend of ours who's a percussionist, also a percussion uh, slash band director, uh, Travis Downs. And we would always get together and uh, help each other with our summer camps and type things. Um, and so we'd always talk about a summer percussion camp. And uh, our kids would go off to some band camps and they would come back and not always be um, as excited about the camp as we would like for them to be. A lot of times sitting in the back, you know, typical percussionist sitting in the back, not having an opportunity to play a lot. So again, we would get together, we'd talk about we need to start a percussion camp. And so uh, we finally just said, well, why don't we do it? And so that's, that's kind of what happened. We just decided, okay, we're going to do it. And uh, so we did. And we, uh, the three of us, the first year, we were the only teachers. Three of us taught it. I think we had 55, 60 kids that year. And now we average somewhere around 100 kids um, in that camp a year. And that, that camp is just for middle school kids, um, sixth to eighth grade. And, um, and we, again, we, we try to go over and beyond uh, whatever each, we set it up into class periods and clinics and concerts and every class period is a different instrument. One class you're doing drum set, one class you're doing steel drums, one class you're doing taiko drums. And so the cool thing about this area is the schools are so close together um, that we all can kind of borrow equipment from each other. Um, like I don't have steel drums, but a school right down the road does. And so, you know, they let me borrow their steel drums for the camp. So the kids get to do a, a, just a variety of things where they don't normally get to do in an average band room or an average camp. And so uh, that's one thing we really love about it. And the other thing is it's hands on all the time. We make sure we have enough equipment in the room so that every kid is playing. Um, usually we break the classes down to about um, 18, 22 kids in a, in a class. And so we make sure whatever subject they're going in, be it keyboard, uh, marching drum line, drum set, we have 18 to 22 instruments that kid can play on. And so think about that for a second. Think about setting up uh, 20 drum sets. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to. <laughs> I had clutches, you know, that will actually work on a hi-hat stand uh, and, you know, 20 bass pedals. Um, so it's, um, we spend a lot of time setting up for that camp, but it's, I don't, I don't think there's anything around it, but definitely in this area, I don't think there's any, uh, anything else around it. And then we started the, the other camp, the Atlanta Percussion Symposium, because we had students that were came to the middle school camp sixth seventh and eighth grade then once they left eighth grade they wanted to come back in high school and so we had a lot of kids really wanting to do that wanted to come back and so for a few years we just put them kind of in an advanced class in the north georgia camp and then we finally realized we really need to separate the, the students out a little bit more and uh, have some classes specifically for those so that's when we started the separate camp and it's for advanced high school students and she Wu has been in, in, uh, involved in that since we started it. And so, um, and so she's the, one of the other staff people that come back every year to teach, help teach that camp. And she brings in uh, people like last year we had Tim Adams, uh, Chris Lamb has come and taught it with her. So we've um, some, some really good teachers to work with that camp also. Yeah. So, and that will, that's, we don't know yet uh, about this summer. Is that is it still a little bit up in the air with all this? Uh, it was, uh, the camp was scheduled for the first week of June, so we had to go ahead and and cancel. Uh, bringing people in from out of state and flights and hotel rooms and that kind of thing. 
Um, we, we, we tried to wait as long as we could, but we finally had to uh, cancel. Yeah, well, we look forward to it in 2021 because you really, when you think about it, there's a incredible, um, a lot of great ensembles down in, the, in your area, in Georgia. You know, certainly with, with us and the marching things, I, I can't imagine how many kids in Atlanta Quest have come through there and, you know, they got their start, you know, with just having a positive experience probably at one of these camps and, you know, okay, I'll just keep doing this and, you know, it's fun. And then they go on to be just killer players. So, man, you, what a great influence you have. I mean, actually, I have had kids come back. Uh, actually, the guy, the gentleman who's taking my place at Lasseter uh, next year, he actually came to my camp when he was in middle school and uh, met a college professor at that camp and decided that he wanted to major in music at that camp. And he's not the only kid that has come through and, and told me that, that uh, how much they, they love that camp. So it's, it's, it's a cool experience as a teacher. Congrats, Mike. And that is, I mean, I, I assume it's not for the six-figure salary. <laughs> no, no, you got to love what you do. But, uh, oh, well, if, if, if I'm going to be doing this, there's no better place to do it than where I'm at right now. Very cool. Um, so we've talked a little bit about, you know, the and some of the things that you guys do on the, on the fly and in person. But you also had, y'all, you and Scott set up to do uh, a something through Roll Off Productions called uh, Field Level, right? Can you tell a little bit about that? Right. Um, I guess we started that. Um, we were doing a, a marching percussion clinic at a GMEA, the Georgia Music Educators Association, one year. And Scott and I were doing it. We were sitting in my house and we were on. Uh, yeah, we were kind of writing out notes, things, topics that we should think, thought we should cover, and a little bit about those topics. So we're sitting there, and we're writing, he's writing, I'm writing, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. Then we start comparing notes, and we just look at each other and go, there's no way we're covering all this in an hour's time. And, uh, so it was like, this could be a book. And it was like a light bulb went off, and we're like, okay, let's write a book. So that's kind of how it started. Um, then, of course, it took us years to finally, because we would write it and then rewrite and rewrite again to, uh, to, to finish it. But um, the book is called Field Level. It's published by Roloff. And at that point in time, there were really no um, drumline method books for a band director that didn't have a percussion specialist or a young, a young percussion specialist to look at and kind of follow. Uh, there were books out there uh, that, you know, had drum corps, excerpts from drum corps music and their cadences and that type of thing. But that really is not going to help your, your typical band director. So we thought we would gear it towards band directors. And that's, that's how we set it up. Um, we talk about every instrument and in the uh, marching percussion ensemble all the way from snare drum to marimba. And, you know, we talk about... Um, the mechanics and the difference between playing snare drum and playing tenors, you know, playing tenors and playing bass drum, how each instrument is totally different. And then we, we gave exercises specific to just those instruments. Um, and then there was a whole section also where we did an entire exercise program that someone could use. And that's, you know, fundamentals started with eight on hand and went through rolls and flams. Uh, but it was on a, the ex, everything was on a disc. The exercises were on a disc, so a band director could put that in and print out all the parts for his marching percussion section. I mean, we wrote all the keyboard parts out. We did timpani parts. We did cymbal parts. We did everything. Uh, even wrote it out for three, three, four, and five bass drums. Um, so that way, a band director could could buy that book, uh, print out the parts, and um, have have some knowledge and have somewhere to go with that. Right, because not not every band program has, you know, I have five, six, seven people on the percussion staff. Sometimes it's just just the band director, and it may not be, you know, their forte percussion. So right. that's a that's a cool tool to gear directly towards them. Lucky that we've had uh, a few colleges that have that have used it in their um, methods courses for band directors. So we've been 
been really excited about that also. That's really awesome. Um, Mike, can you talk a little bit about um, taking ensembles, like these ensembles have performed at, you know, the Lassiter uh, symposium uh, that you guys do, but they are sought after all over the place. So you guys have performed at Midwest and the Percussive Arts Society uh, convention. Uh, what's it like prepping those guys uh, for for those things? Well, again, it's just it, it's just planning ahead, knowing what's coming up, being able to financially raise the money to uh, be able to go to those places, and to just um, be able to mentally just be able to tell the kids what's coming up so they can prepare. Um, and so it's, it's just about preparation. We've had the honor of performing at the Midwest Clinic twice, uh, 2005 and 2011, I believe it was. Uh, 2005, we performed with uh, Michael Burrett. Uh, he was the soloist on the concert. We actually commissioned him to compose a piece for the ensemble. And so he wrote, uh, it's called the Blue Flame Quintet. And so it was for percussion soloists, which was Michael and a quartet. And so, um, so that was a great performance to be able to play with him and have him come in and work with the ensemble. And then in 2011, we actually had uh, Casey Cangelosi came in and soloed with us. And we did his arrangement of a uh, of white knuckle, uh, white knuckle stroll. Uh, well, no, that was, I'm sorry. That's a different, that was GMEA. Uh, 2011, we actually had Boston Brass and John Parks from FSU came in and soloed with us. Um, and so Rick, the young, who you know really well, is artist relations with KHS. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> so Rick actually composed a piece for us for brass quintet and percussion en ensemble called A Tuneful Magnum Opus. And so we, prepared, we uh, premiered that piece in 2011 with the Boston Brass. And since then, I think he's uh, arranged it for full band. Uh, brass quintet with full band. So those were the two Midwest performances. 2007, uh, we did PASIC. And uh, I guess all these things, I have little stories about them because that performance, I remember we, we performed on Saturday at PASIC. And the Saturday before that, we were in New York uh, competing at a BOA regional. And so, uh, so we were trying to do both of those things at the same time. And you're talking about being stressful. That was uh, that was stressful and that that took you know that takes some planning and to work with the uh the band directors about okay i'm doing ensemble this day i'll be out with the marching band this day uh and just you know trying to work together as a team and to uh, get a schedule together that that will that we could do both events and do both events successfully uh i remember when we got to um new york and got to the hotel we had rented out a separate ballroom uh for the percussion ensemble to rehearse because we knew we were going to have some time downtime that night. And so I uh, planned a two hour rehearsal. I knew what selections I was going to be working on. We already had most of the equipment there in the front ensemble anyway. And so the things that weren't in the front ensemble, we loaded on the truck and uh, took to New York with us. And uh, when we got there, we unloaded all that equipment. And so the percussion ensemble rehearsed that night, Friday night before the BOA regional on Saturday. Um, I think the band got home on Monday from that trip, ensemble rehearsed Tuesday, Wednesday, and then we got on a bus Thursday and headed to uh, the basic. <laughs> I can already tell that I would crash and burn at your program. <laughs> yeah, it was, again, just variety. We, uh, the Music for All Sandy Felstein National Percussion Festival, uh, we got to perform there three different times uh, with the ensemble. And also got to perform there with Simpson Middle School, which is a, the middle school that I taught at uh, that uh, feeds into Lasseter. And so um, we uh, took the middle school, middle school percussion ensemble and we performed there. And as a matter of fact, I think that was 2010. And uh, it was Simpson Middle School and Dickerson Middle School where Scott teaches at. We were the first, we, we played there the same year together. And we were the first two middle school percussion ensembles to play at that festival. So, uh, so that was kind of cool to get to do that. Um, we've done, I guess, five performances, I think, at the Georgia Music Educators Association, which is our state music convention. We've done two clinics with the marching band, and we've done three different 
performances with the percussion ensemble. And that's where I was talking about Casey came in. The last one we did, uh, Casey came in and soloed with us on, on that performance. Do your kids know that, that this is not common that to be able to travel in there? I'm in New York one weekend. I'm in Indiana or Chicago another. Like, do they – or the amount of people that are coming in, like world-class musicians playing with them, do they – do they think it's every group? Yeah, they have no idea. To them, it's just their high school band. I mean, this is my high school band. This is what you do in high school band, isn't it? You know, <laughs> that's kind of what they think. Now, once they leave, you know, I've had so many kids, once they leave, they come back and go, yeah, I did, didn't really realize what we had here was pretty special. Uh, so they, they find out, I think, later on. They realize it later on. Uh, the, hindsight, <laughs> the hindsight is uh, – really spectacular at Lassiter High School. Um, yeah. Well, man, those are, like I said, that is not a, that is not a typical uh, high school uh, path of percussion ensemble. You know, we, we would get, love to have just a taste of one of those things. And I'm, what a, what a great thing that you guys have, uh, uh, what a great high school experience that you guys have provided. I mean, it's just a complete success. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I've been fortunate. It's a great situation and uh, great leadership and a lot of supportive parents and great kids, you know? Well, you are, you're certainly uh, a great educator to all those kids and um, a great mentor, um, uh, really kind of a pillar in the, the percussion community. And we do have a, uh, a couple of folks that uh, wanted to wish you well uh, as as you take just a small step back from Lassiter and just just a little bit. But there was some there were some people that just wanted to um, send you a quick little message. Hey, Mike Lynch. This is Leif Cook up at Dobbins Bennett in Tennessee, and all your Tennessee colleagues wish you the best in your retirement. And many of us who are getting close uh, envy you, especially given everything that's going on. Anyway, you have a legacy that you leave down there in Georgia, and I know everyone joins me in wishing you the best. Good luck. Hey, Mike. Corey Friend here from Dallas, Texas. Got a chance to check out what was going on down at Lassiter in 2015 with the Moorhead State Percussion Ensemble. Amazing program, amazing students, amazing facilities. Congrats on a great career and have a happy retirement, man. What's up, Mike? It's Romo. Man, you made it. You're graduating. You're going on. Congratulations on a great career, a great run. You know, you were one of the first people that talked to me here when I moved uh, to Cobb County from Southern California. And I've always appreciated your friendship. Wish you the best of luck. Look forward to still seeing you at all of our uh, big percussion events around town. So congratulations. You did it. Hey Mike, congratulations again on your retirement from Lasseter. Just want to say thank you for the um, experiences I had and the opportunities that I gained and the knowledge I gained uh, working with you at Lasseter and just the example that you've set for percussion programs, you know, around the country, you know, particularly in the Southeast. Uh, I know you're, you're not done, so we'll see you around. Good luck. Hey Mike Lynch, greetings from Jeff Fondren at Hoover High School. I just wanted to take the opportunity to wish you the best, very best in your upcoming retirement. And I want you to understand that so many of us percussion educators look up to you. Anytime that there is a meeting or any time that there is talk of trying to find out some great advice or best practices from percussion educators, your name always comes to the top of the list. I've always respected you and have continued that utmost respect because you are a great person, a great teacher, a great friend. You're always welcome in Hoover, Alabama, anytime that you're around. Cheers, my friend, on a great, great career. Mike, congratulations on such an amazing tenure at the last year of high school. You're such an inspiring role model for all of us. We know you will continue to share your gifts and talents with us. So see you around. Congratulations, Mike. Thanks for everything you've done for the percussion community. Happy, Happy retirement. Hey, Mike. Congratulations on your retirement. No question you deserve it and have earned it. 
Um, thank you so much, not only for everything that you've done at Lassiter and the outstanding program that you've built there, but everything that you've contributed to the percussion community as a whole. Um, and, and your work as an amazing brand ambassador for us at KHS America. Uh, it has been an absolute honor and privilege to collaborate with you over the years. Um, I'm sure there's more to come. Uh, there's more pieces to be written, um, consultations to be had, events to put on. Uh, hopefully you can still be involved in some of that and I look forward to continuing to communicate with you on that. Um, hope we can talk soon. All the best, my friend. Wow, that yeah. was pretty incredible. There's a, I mean, and you're you're still you're still you can't just stop. So you're still going, um, but you know it's certainly that that tenure at uh, Lassiter and like you said, you, like you said, you're you'll you'll still be in it. Um, but obviously, you know, there's a ton of just great you know the, all those people were just great percussionists and really look up to you so congrats well thank you i mean i'm i'm flabbergasted i mean that was a uh, quite a range of, of people there and so um it's thank you and thank to thanks to all those people for the the wonderful comments yeah well well man i i have certainly enjoyed um talking here and i like to always end these on a, a fun and happy note uh so if you're not at friday night football games anymore what are you going to be doing on friday nights uh nowhere near a high school football stadium i guarantee you that <laughs> i've i've spent 36 years of going to high school football games and um, i'm looking forward to not being there on a friday night uh, I do have uh, three middle schools lined up for next year that I'll go in probably once a week and teach percussion um, all day, uh, uh, six periods for those schools. So I'm looking forward to to doing that. I, I try not to put um, a whole lot on Friday or try not to do anything on Friday and very little on Monday. So it does kind of seem like I'm a little bit retired. Um, I have my drums that I'll be working on. Uh, my wife thinks I need an inter intervention there that I'm getting so many, but I, I just assure her that all drummers have that many drums. That's nothing unusual. <laughs> so uh, I'll be doing that. And uh, like I said, hopefully getting back on the bike a little bit and, and riding a little bit more. Wow. That's awesome. Uh, yes. Some of us have a plethora of drums. All if you ask any <laughs> of the, the Mapex guys. Right. Some of us don't uh, aren't in such good graces with our our uh, <laughs> significant others with the amount of room that we take up. Yeah, my my, my daughter got married and moved out, so I kind of took over <laughs> took over her room. <laughs> the bedroom became the drum room. Great. Yeah. Uh, well, Mike, is there anything else you'd like to to wish to, or to say to anybody else out there? No, I mean it just. You know, um, um, uh, I've enjoyed my time teaching and percussion and, and band and to just young instructors, just a few things, you know, just make sure you never stop learning. Um, don't get in your own little bubble and not realize what's going on around you. Go to concerts, go to clinics, go watch other people rehearse, go watch different types of groups rehearse. Um, so you can, um, you know, like I said, you don't get stuck in your, your own little bubble. Make sure you surround yourself with really good people. If you don't know how to get do something, I'm sure there's somewhere close by that does know how to do it. Make sure you get them in. And don't, don't just get them to do it, but stand there or sit there and watch them do it so that next time you, you learn that and you know how to teach it. And you know, don't let your, your ego get in the way of bringing people in and, and watching them work with your groups. Um, and I guess the last thing is just enjoy the, enjoy the journey, enjoy the ride. Uh, and that, that takes a little bit of time to, uh, to learn to do that. But, uh, you know, with good planning, good planning, you, you should be good. And there's, there's always things going to happen that uh, interrupt. You know, we all have issues and that happen with our programs or happen personally. Um, but, you know, plan ahead and just try to, try to enjoy the journey and enjoy the performances and enjoy teaching the kids. That's that's worth coming for right there. That is, that is the A game straight from the, the top of the mountain. 
Well, Mike, thanks so much. Uh, really looked, uh, it was great to talk to you a little bit. And thank you everybody else for stopping in for another Focus Friday. Uh, now's a great time to sit down, practice. We'll come out of this better players, better people. All right, have a good one.